I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. I'm standing on a very peaceful sort of promontory. The Mediterranean sun is bouncing back off the, the brown sand beneath my feet. The light is flashing off the little wavelets out at sea and lush green undergrowth around me. But there's also a lot of exposed sandy rock and cliff. Uh, it's a very steep climb up from the, the beach below. It was pitch dark. Then all of a sudden the coast, a dim outline of the coast loomed up. As we got closer, we were all beginning tensed up now and nervous, wondering what was going to happen as everything was so quiet. The colonel of the regiment called all the men together on the forward well deck and told us that we were going into action and that our job was to support the 3rd Brigade who would make the initial landing. And he said, God bless you all, boys. There won't be many of you alive by this time tomorrow night, which didn't cheer us up very much. The Mediterranean Expeditionary Force prepared to attack. The troops involved were a random collection of units composed of a mixture of nationalities, including British, French, Indians and troops from elsewhere. At 4.30am, the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps arrived slightly further north than planned at a sheltered beach which I'm standing just above now that would become known as Anzac Cove. We were all crouched in the boat when within sight of the shore we could see the cliffs in the background because it was just breaking day. To us this looked quite a formidable object and uh, not having been briefed we didn't know what was going to happen when we landed. The men came in on, on small boats, uh, pinnaces and other boats, uh, from ships out at sea, for example, the Gilecka and HMS London. Private Frank Brent described his feelings as they approached. Well, I was one of about 2,000 blokes stuck in the Gilecka. We were all camped down in the bowels of the ship, but we couldn't sleep, but we just talked about anything but the job we were going to do. And as we were lined up, the old boatswain of the Galica came along and said, anybody got any of those dirty postcards that you bought in Cairo? If you have, you better put them down on the deck, because if you get knocked, they send them to your next of kin. Well, by this time, I was feeling just about as brave as a ringtail possum. And, uh, I wish that I was anywhere but on the Galica. We lined up on the decks of the ship. We scrambled over into the boats the best way we knew how and proceeded to row ashore. Then a single shot rang out and a yellowish light flared up in the sky. From then, everything was let loose. Machine gun and rifle fire directed at the boats. But as I got into the boat, the first thing that struck me were the, about three chaps of the 9th Battalion who had been killed and they hadn't had time to lift them out. So we had to walk gingerly over these fellows. Shrapnel was falling, the machine guns were pelting. And uh, as the pinnace hit the shore, we boats at the back were pulled up into anything three, four foot of water. As soon as the boats grounded, it was every man for himself. It was out. Scramble ashore the best you could. Uh, we got lumbering this shovel and rifle and pack and ammunition. As I say, we were loaded like blessed elephants. We made immediately for the cliff over a stretch of about 30 yards of beach on which several dead bodies were lying, smothered in blowflies. They came ashore in waves. They faced extraordinary terrain, terrain that is not suitable for amphibious assault. Uh, towering cliffs, 
very steep sided hills, extremely difficult terrain to cross. And of course, above those hills, on top of these cliffs, are Turkish snipers, Turkish soldiers who are able to look down on the troops as they advance. First thing we did wasn't to look around, but to run for the cover of the cliff. And it was there that uh, there was quite a lot of confusion, of course. And we were waiting for some sort of command. But uh, I just cannot remember ever hearing one given. And then there's also an increasing amount of Turkish fire from bigger guns near Gaba Tepe. We had about 50 yards or less to go to the first broken ground that would give us cover from the fire because fire along the beach was very heavy indeed. As we scrambled ashore, as we were lucky enough to get there, we found what cover under the cliff we could. As we lay there for a few moments, gathering our wind, fixed our bayonets. We couldn't help noticing the large number of dead. They were under the lee of this about six feet of broken ground. Once you got climbed that and got over the top, very heavy fire would cut at least 50% down. Those that had survived the landing now faced a treacherous climb through a steep ravine that became known as Shrapnel Valley, a fractured landscape of ridges and gullies with Turkish riflemen hidden at the top of surrounding hills. Today, by contrast, it's a peaceful, very tranquil place, reclaimed by nature, and at the bottom, one of the most beautiful cemeteries I've ever seen. We proceeded immediately up the cliff, taking what cover we could from the very short scrub, and finally reached the top. Uh, I found myself by this time mixed up amongst New Zealanders. And from there on, it was a question of lie on your tummy, sneak forward as far forward as you could get, and fire wherever you saw any movement ahead of you. I'm now on the very southern tip of the Gallipoli Peninsula. This is Cape Helles, and around the tip of this peninsula, there were uh, five landing beaches. They were codenamed S, V, W, X and Y, and they are a series of landings here just a few hours after the landings at Anzac Cove, and, and really it was designed to confuse the Turks. The main landings were at W and V by the 29th Division. There are very few of their voices in the Imperial War Museum collection, partly because they were subjected to a terrible slaughter when they landed on the beaches below me here in Gallipoli. If they survived the landing, then they had to endure six months of futile fighting. The first Lancashire Fusiliers rode into W Beach, which is just down to my left, at 6am on the 25th of April. The Turks were ready for them. Private Sydney Hall was there. So before we got out of the boat, we were all under fire. But were you frightened? I wasn't. I had no nerve, I had anything. But I didn't know what I was going in to tell you the truth, you know. No. I followed Captain Giddis down the gangway, lay down in the bow, just enough cover to hide us. So he said, well, come on, over we go. Private W. Flynn took part in the landings on V Beach from the ship River Clyde. Because I lost him, and uh, I come up once or twice with fresh air, and I drifted to me right, and I come up by this uh, strip of rock, and it was piled high with dead, D Company mostly, and H, they jumped, it must have jumped into the water and managed to get to this rock, and eventually got killed, majority of them. I managed to just crawl onto the rock, I was exhausted. I thought my knees had bullets holes in them all over, <laughs> where I'd been on the bottom. Like. After a while, they was pumping, still pumping lead into all the bodies, any movement. Right on the top of that beach, when we got up there, there was a trench right the way round. We got fired on, and the, the trench right round. And all I had to do was just to lean over and fire, shoot us all down. Well, we lost half our men landing. As soon as them the steam pennants started to go away to sea, well, they opened up on the shore. And there wasn't a shot fired before that, only our Navy. Not a shot. And there was firing not only machine guns, rifles, fire, 
They had these nice little pom-pom shells, all nice painted colours, beautiful things. <laughs> and they was hitting off at the side of the ship and ripping the people to pieces. And even the bullets, if they missed you, was hitting the ship and going and tearing pieces out of them. Well, I didn't see it myself, but he had one chap, tell the war man he was, young fella, about 19, 20, had his stomach in his hand. As later waves of attacking Allied soldiers came in, evidence of what had happened at those beaches lay all around them. The conditions were indescribable. Wounded, dead, dying, rifles left all over the place, packs that the chaps had chucked off as they advanced in the first assault. Stretcher bearer Frank Kennedy was with the Anzacs. And the first thing, the first order I was given was to, to try and get the bodies carried under cover. We did our best, we went up. But the carrying of the stretchers down those slopes was the most difficult thing that every, any stretcher bearer could do. To try and ease the pain of the chap on the stretcher, stepping down, stepping down, perhaps stumbling over some bushes which we carried on right on until the evening, getting as many as we could down there. The Gallipoli landings were a chaotic and bloody start to what would be a futile, disastrous campaign in the east. Ordinary seaman Joe Murray landed at W Beach on the 28th of April. People still lying about dead. There was a lot of people in the water dead. You see, the men had the full uniforms on and the weight of the uniform kept them down. They say the sea was actually raised, but uh, no, I can't say that. Not on the 27th, the old 28th. I, I couldn't say that. But they say that originally the sea was raised. Suddenly you'd be coming down from the front line and you'd hear a call in a bush probably 20 yards away. Stretch a bearer, stretch a bearer mournful cry, all you could do was to ease your stretcher down on the ground for a moment, go over to see the case, give him an injection if it was necessary, give him some tablets to ease the pain and tell him you'd come back for him. But it was all through the night, right until midnight. I was so exhausted, I don't know what the time was, I, when I got down to the beach of the dressing station, I fell down and fell fast asleep. I woke early the next morning, and I was asked again to go, go along towards the front lines again as there had been more wounded during the night. We carried on this work for three solid days, right up until that to withdraw down to the beach. The casualties were enormous. The sacrifices were great. Almost at once, at 10 o'clock at night, the Turks had started attacking in the dark at that time of night. And you've got a rifle. And you've got enemy in front. Anything moves, you fire. And then you talk about afterwards. Were you, were you tired by then? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, I could hardly keep my eyes open. We'd been awake all night. We'd been awake the night before, no. All the time, just a case of shut eye, you know. You get energy from nowhere. You simply, where have I got to go? You know, and off you go, see? 